The far right is on the rise in Latin America, and this can have significant implications not only for the region, but for the entire world. On the 19th of November, one of the most extreme politicians in all of Argentina won the presidential election. His name is Javier Milei, and he ran on an extreme right-wing platform. His fans affectionately refer to him as the madman, or because of his crazy hair, they call him the wig, and his symbol is the chainsaw. Millet has brought chainsaws to his rallies and pledged that he's going to cut government spending down to the bone. He pledged to abolish most state institutions, including the ministries of health, education, science, technology, transportation, public works, culture, and most other government ministries. He wants to completely privatize all social services and sell them off to for-profit corporations, including he wants to get rid of social security for elderly people who retired. He wants to get rid of public health care and education, and everything will be run on a for-profit basis by corporations. He also wants to end Argentina's monetary sovereignty, abandoning its currency, the peso, and instead adopting the US dollar as the official currency of Argentina. In the same vein, Millet has pledged to break off diplomatic relations with China and also with Argentina's neighbor, Brazil, and both of those countries happen to be the largest trading partners of Argentina, responsible for 35% of the country's trade. While pledging to cut ties with China, Millet has pledged to deepen Argentina's alliance with the United States. I mean, he already wants to subordinate Argentina's monetary policy to the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, and abandon monetary sovereignty. But furthermore, he said very clearly that Argentina's top allies will be the United States and Israel. Millet has given rallies in which he waved the Israeli flag, and he has pledged staunch support for the Israeli regime as it carries out war crimes against the occupied Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza. And Millet's victory will also have significant geopolitical implications because Argentina was supposed to join the BRICS bloc of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. At the summit of the BRICS in August in South Africa, Argentina was one of six countries that was invited to join. However, Millet has said that he will not join BRICS and instead he wants to sabotage this organization and subordinate his country to the US and other Western countries. In the same vein, Millet is adamantly against the attempt by progressive leaders across Latin America to try to unite the region. Brazil's left-wing president Lula da Silva has called for creating a new currency in Latin America to end the region's dependency on the US dollar. And of course, Millet in Argentina would completely withdraw from that project. He is not in any way interested, and on the contrary, he wants to attack the regional efforts to end Latin America's dependence on the US economy and the US dollar. Instead, he wants the region to be even more dependent on the dollar. Now, while Millet has a libertarian discourse, in reality, many of the policies that he has proposed are extremely authoritarian. And in fact, he is very similar to the fascist dictator of Chile, Augusto Pinochet, who was installed in a US-backed coup in 1973 and who also used libertarian rhetoric while imposing a brutal military regime. Millet has also whitewashed the fascist dictatorship that governed Argentina in the 1970s with US support. He has denied its mass murder and torture and disappearing of tens of thousands of leftists in Argentina. Millet has pledged to militarize the country, to create private for-profit prisons, to make it easier for police to imprison people, and most hypocritically of all, the so-called libertarian pledged in his presidential platform that he will create a national surveillance system, creating a database to track citizens and installing surveillance cameras all across the country with facial recognition technology to track where people are going. It's clearly not very libertarian, but then you can also consider 
another hypocritical aspect, which is that the so-called libertarian has pledged that he's going to make abortion illegal in Argentina, and at the same time, while banning abortion, perhaps the most extreme, outrageous idea that Millet has proposed is the possibility of legalizing the sale of children. You heard that correctly, I'm not joking. The president-elect of Argentina, far-right extremist Javier Millet, proposed to create a so-called free market for adoptions or a free market for babies so pregnant women who don't want to give birth but they can't get an abortion under his libertarian fascist regime, instead he says that they should sell their children on the free market to people who want to adopt children. This also complements Millet's other proposal, which he's, he wants to create free markets for human organs. He wants to make it legal to buy and sell human organs because he's an extreme free market fundamentalist and his solution to every problem in society is privatizing everything and selling them off to big corporations. And he claims that for-profit corporations will run everything efficiently and will solve all problems in society. It's replacing what he calls the so-called tyranny of the state and taxation, which he refers to as theft. He wants to replace that with privatized tyranny, giving complete control to big corporations and, once again, to the military and police which she wants to strengthen and also build private prisons to put poor people in. Now, those are just his political proposals. There's also the fact that many people in Argentina consider him to be genuinely insane. He is mentally unstable. You can see this in some of the interviews that he's done where he makes very bizarre comments. And he even said that his dead dog, which he named Conan after Conan the Barbarian, can speak to him from the afterlife, and Millet claimed that his dead dog advises him on economic policy. As if that weren't bizarre enough, Millet also paid $50,000 to clone that dog that died, Conan the zombie dog, and he made five clones from that same dog, and each of those clone dogs he named after far-right free market fundamentalist economists. So the political situation in Argentina is extremely unstable. This is the third largest country in Latin America, and again, it will have significant geopolitical consequences given that Millet has pledged to break relations with China and Brazil, to sabotage the BRICS, to sabotage Latin American attempts at regional integration, and to completely subordinate his country to the United States. Today I'm going to be explaining why and how such an extreme figure was able to win the election in Argentina, and I will provide a brief history of the economic crises in Argentina, because the reality is that this country has been suffering from severe economic problems. Inflation is at over 100%, and there are a lot of people who are frustrated, but this is not the first time in Argentina that the country has suffered from a severe economic crisis. For decades, Argentina has been trapped in an economic cycle of booms and busts, of military dictatorships and neoliberal leaders who come to power, who implement a series of policies that never solve the structural problems with the economy. Millet is not the first leader in Argentina who has proposed dollarizing the economy and claimed that it's a silver bullet that will solve all of the country's problems. Proposing that Argentina abolish its central bank and adopt the US dollar as Millet does is really just calling for the most extreme form of a peg possible. Because Argentina cannot print dollars, only the US can print dollars. So by getting rid of its monetary sovereignty, Argentina is taking a peg to the dollar at one to one. And in previous decades, there have been numerous right-wing leaders who have tried basically the exact same policy by pegging the Argentine peso to the dollar. And every single time, it resulted in a collapse it resulted in a significant devaluation of the currency and an end to the peg, and it resulted in significant unemployment, it resulted in a rise in poverty and inequality, and it only further exacerbated the chronic structural problems in the Argentine economy, which largely revolve around the fact 
that Argentina's economy is primarily based on the export of raw materials and agricultural products. It does not have a significant manufacturing base, which means that one, Argentina's economy is very dependent on the commodity super cycle, the booms and busts of the price of these products on the international market. And two, it means that Argentina is also very dependent on importing foreign capital goods and machine parts and technologies. It cannot produce those internally in the country because decades of neoliberal economic policies led Argentina to deindustrialize, to destroy its manufacturing base, and to become completely dependent on foreign imports and to become trapped in this cycle in which, once again, Argentina exports low value added products like, like raw materials and agricultural products and imports high value added capital goods and products and technologies. And that means that Argentina consistently needs more money to fund those imports and it chronically takes on more and more debt. And in fact, Argentina has been a poster child of US debt traps. Now, we hear a lot of propaganda on the Western media accusing China of supposedly having debt trap diplomacy. But the reality is that Argentina is an example of a country that for decades has been trapped in odious, unpayable debt owed to U.S. bondholders and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which is an institution in which only the U.S. has veto power. It is essentially controlled by Washington, and the IMF has continued to impose on Argentina right-wing neoliberal economic policies, telling it to try to export more and more raw materials and agricultural products, and encouraging further deindustrialization of the country, preventing Argentina from implementing the kind of protectionist economic policies that it would need to industrially develop as it did in the 1950s. And now Argentina continues to be trapped in this unpayable debt. It can simply not get out. And as Argentina has run out of foreign exchange reserves, it can no longer get access to dollars. Its currency has continued to decline in value, fueling more inflation and therefore pouring fuel on the fire of right wing extremism. And that explains how you have figures like Javier Millet. He is really the product of a neo-colonial economic system that the United States leads with institutions like the IMF and capital markets based in Wall Street and vulture funds based in New York that have invested in billions of dollars in debt that Argentina owes to them. And then when Argentina cannot pay them, they use the US justice system to force Argentina to seize Argentina's foreign assets to pay billions of dollars of profits to the speculators on Wall Street, these foreign bondholders and the reality is that Argentina has little economic sovereignty. It's trapped in this neo-colonial relationship. And because leaders, popular nationalist leaders, especially left-wing leaders, are unable to implement the kind of ambitious social programs that they would need to economically transform the country and reindustrialize the country, voters have gotten frustrated with the huge inflation, and they have been misled by this demagogue, this far-right extremist, Javier Millet, who claims that the solution to all of these structural problems is easy, abandoning sovereignty, turning Argentina into a U.S. colony. And at the same time, the other candidate who was running in the presidential election in Argentina, Sergio Massa, was associated with the economic crisis and his capitulation to the US controlled International Monetary Fund and Argentina's unpayable odious debt. Now, Sergio Massa represented the center or center right, honestly, of the, the Peronist coalition. And the reason that he became the presidential candidate is because the popular leftist leader, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, she was not able to run in the election because of what was essentially a judicial coup against her. I did a previous video and article about this, which I will link to in the description below, explaining how in Argentina, the judicial system is controlled by right-wing oligarchs, and it's extremely corrupt, and billionaires have been caught bribing judges and whining and dining them in their mansions and giving them, you know, luxurious vacations. And these right-wing oligarchs conspired with 
the judiciary, the corrupt judges, to prevent Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner from running for office. She is the most popular politician in Argentina, and her former husband was also president, Nestor de Kirchner. There was even an assassination attempt against Kirchner by a right-wing extremist, because this is how desperate they were to prevent her from running for office. Kirchner had famously campaigned against the International Monetary Fund and its neo-colonial debt trap policies, and she made it clear that the debt that Argentina has is odious and is unpayable and should not be paid. She became famous in Argentina for defending her country's national sovereignty at the United Nations and criticizing the vulture funds on Wall Street who were profiting by buying up Argentine debt, Argentine bonds, and making huge profits. She said that these vulture funds were engaged in economic terrorism against her people. So therefore, there was a kind of judicial coup that prevented an actual left alternative, which meant that at the end of the day, the election was between a far-right extremist and a center-right neoliberal, Sergio Massa, who was associated with the exact same IMF neoliberal policies that trapped Argentina in this economic crisis in the first place. So given the fact that there was not really an alternative, some people said, well, maybe we'll just go with this crazy guy who has these new ideas because even though they might sound insane, at least there's something different because we cannot keep repeating these neoliberal disastrous policies that we've been doing for so many years that have got us in this place. It must be emphasized, this is a structural problem, not only with the economy of Argentina, but of many countries in the global south. In the case of Argentina, it's not only that its economy is so dependent on exporting agricultural products, but that the, those agricultural products are largely produced by big landowners, big ag corporations that belong to very wealthy elite oligarchs. And these conservative oligarchs that are huge landowners, they have significant influence in the political system and they have consistently opposed the national programs of progressive leaders to industrialize the country, going back to the leader Perón, Juan Perón, was a very complicated figure in Argentine history, but one who embarked upon an ambitious industrialization program, making the Argentine economy more self-sufficient. And that was the golden era for the Argentine economy. And for the decades ever since, we've seen that the Argentine economy has gone back and forth with US-backed military dictatorships and right-wing regimes, deindustrializing the country and imposing neoliberal economic policies. And then you have the return of these nationalist, developmentalist, Peronist governments that try to embark upon some kind of industrialization strategy. And sometimes it has great success, sometimes it doesn't. But at the end of the day, this is a structural problem. Not only is Argentina trapped in it, but many other countries in the global south are trapped in this. And the way out is fundamentally challenging the neoliberal economic model that is imposed on these countries by institutions like the IMF. But instead of actually trying to challenge that neoliberal financialized system and reindustrializing Argentina, like Brazil is now trying to do under the Workers' Party and President Lula da Silva. Instead of that, Javier Milei, this far-right extremist, he wants to further exacerbate these problems of dependency and further subordinate Argentina to the United States and making matters even worse by abandoning monetary sovereignty and adopting the US dollar, these policies by Millet would significantly overvalue the currency in Argentina, which would be effectively pegged to the dollar, and therefore hurt the competitiveness of Argentine exports, that is, causing a further decline in Argentina's exports, and instead making the country even more dependent on imports, which is exactly the problem in the first place, therefore fueling more deindustrialization and more financialization, which means the country will be even further dependent on foreign investors and speculators. And all of this, once again, just serves to perpetuate the exact same problems that Argentina has been trapped in for decades. This is exactly what was argued by the renowned South Korean development economist, Ha Jun Cheng, who is a professor of economics at Cambridge University. 
And in May, I published an article and a video, which I will link to in the description below, in which Ha Jun Cheng visited Argentina and he discussed the economic crisis in the country. And he said that the so-called solution proposed by Millet to adopt the US dollar is insane. That's the term he used. And he said it would turn Argentina into a US colony. So what do you think? I mean, obviously, these days in Argentina, there's a lot of talk about dollarization, mm -hmm. right? It's like it's the magical solution that is going to solve all of our problems. We just dollarize the economy and that's the end of it. What what do yeah, you think well, when you hear that? Well, you know, I think uh, if you want to adopt uh, dollar as uh, your official currency, you should apply to become a colony of the United States of America. Eh? Because uh, that's what it uh, that, uh, makes you, yeah. Because uh, that uh, you are, this means that your macroeconomic policies will be written in Washington D.C. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, in a big country like the United States, actually, when the macroeconomic policies are made in Washington D.C., there will be states uh, elsewhere in the U.S. Uh, that uh, suffer because you know the, the federal government might be you know, the tightening the economy because that the, in general there is uh, inflation, but then in some regions that there might already be recession and then they'll uh, be in big trouble. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in effect, uh, the single country, that what you do is uh, to you make uh, transfers uh, to these uh, regions uh, suffering from right. yeah, recession. And most importantly, people in those that uh, uh, regions in the economic recession can move elsewhere yeah. to take up jobs in, you know, the, the in areas state. that are doing yeah. well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the fiscal union and labor market integration are the necessary conditions for this uh, the, the, to make uh, the currency union uh, viable. And the reason why the Eurozone had uh, such crisis was because they didn't do this enough. Yeah? Right. Labor market is integrated but there's a language barrier and so on so it's not perfect you know there is no fiscal union so that they can make a transfer to the poor regions so this is why they had such trouble now Argentina unilaterally accepting US dollar as a currency is insane because that you don't have a labor market integration you know you don't have a fiscal transfer it's not as if the Americans are going to say oh that you cute guy, the Argentina, now you want to use dollar as your currency. We'll accept more immigrants from you. You know, we'll uh, give it's you some money. It's never going to happen. No. Right. no, this is uh, the, the worst so, idea. Yeah. Now, Millet has proposed many crazy ideas, but one of the most outrageous among them is his pledge to break off ties with both China and Brazil, considering that these countries are Argentina's two largest trading partners. And even the mainstream media in Argentina have been very worried about this and have published articles noting that in some provinces in Argentina, five provinces, 90% of all exports go to China. And furthermore, 24% of all of Argentina's imports come from Brazil and 19% come from China, whereas 17% of Argentina's exports go to Brazil and 8% go to China. That means that Argentina's trade with Brazil represents 21% of its total and its trade with China represents 14% of its total. That, that means 35%, over one third of Argentina's trade is with these two countries that Millet has pledged to break relations with because he says they're both governed by communists he not only refers to the, the Communist Party of China, but also he refers to Brazil's left-wing president, Lula da Silva, of the Workers' Party as a so-called communist. Bizarrely, Millet also appears to think that Russia is still communist, despite the fact that it restored capitalism in 1991. In an interview this September with the far-right U.S. media host, formerly of Fox News, Tucker Carlson, Millet said that he will not do business with China, Russia, and Brazil because they are communists. This is the exact quote that he told Tucker Carlson. Not only am I not going to do business with China, I'm not going to do business with any communist. The communists don't go there. The Chinese don't go there. Putin doesn't go there. Lula doesn't go there. Instead, Millet said in an interview, quote, 
our geopolitical alignment is with the United States and Israel. We are not going to align with communists. And he was referring to the BRICS as communists. So making it as clear as possible, Argentina will be subordinated to the U.S. and will be closely allied with Israel. Given Millet's close alignment with the U.S., it's also important to point out that he has gotten a lot of support and promotion from the Atlas Network. This is a U.S.-based network of think tanks and media outlets and organizations that fund free market fundamentalist extreme neoliberal ideology with funding from right-wing billionaire oligarchs like the Koch brothers and big corporations like fossil fuel corporations and cigarette companies. And they have been promoting Millet and his extreme right-wing ideology for many years. And now they have bought their way into the presidency in Argentina. And many people have compared Millet to Donald Trump, but in many ways, Millet is even more extreme than Trump. Millet is a follower of the so-called anarcho-capitalist ideology of the right-wing extremist Murray Rothbard from the United States. And Rothbard was an ally of the KKK and white supremacist groups. He famously supported David Duke, the KKK leader, and he opposed civil rights. He opposed women's equality and women's suffrage. And Rothbard also promoted racist so-called race science and advocated for the separation of white Americans and black Americans. Rothbard came out of the far-right Austrian school of economics of free market fundamentalists like Ludwig von Mises, one of his biggest influences, who also is a big ideological influence on Javier Millet. And Rothbard famously wrote, quote, the purely free society will have a flourishing free market in children. Rothbard is the one who actually proposed this idea of creating a market for adoption, a free market to buy and sell children. And Millet is the one now who is trying to implement these far right ideas. And just like Millet, Murray Rothbard tried to form an alliance between libertarians and fascists, uh, an extreme far right alliance that he referred to as right wing populists. And in his writings, this so-called libertarian and self-declared anarcho-capitalist, he actually called for an authoritarian police state to coexist with these free market fundamentalist ideas. He famously wrote that, quote, cops must be unleashed and allowed to administer instant punishment. And he also said that cops should be unleashed to clear the streets of bums and vagrants. So if you're looking for a figure to compare Javier Millet to, to understand him, the most similar is Pinochet, the fascist US-backed dictator who governed Chile after a CIA-sponsored coup overthrew Chile's democratically elected socialist president, Salvador Allende, and installed an extreme free market fundamentalist regime that privatized everything and sold everything off to for-profit corporations while at the same time implementing a fascist police state. Now, to understand how Millet was able to come to power, we need to understand the root of the economic crisis in Argentina. This is a country that is suffering of inflation rates of more than 100%, and yet Argentina's foreign exchange reserves are net negative. It simply does not have the foreign currency that it needs to stabilize its own currency, and at the same time, to pay off Argentina's massive external debt. It is not a coincidence that Argentina owes more debt to the US controlled International Monetary Fund than any other country by far. And if you look at other countries that also owe a lot of money to the IMF, like Egypt, they are similarly suffering from a weakening currency that is depreciating against the dollar and an inflation crisis. How did this happen? Well, in 2018, the US controlled IMF gave Argentina the largest loan in its history at $57 billion. Why did the IMF do this? Because the Trump administration ordered it to do so. And this was revealed by Donald Trump's top Latin American official, Mauricio Claver, who was the US representative at the International Monetary Fund. And he later revealed that Trump ordered the IMF to give the biggest loan in history to 
Argentina's right-wing president, Mauricio Macri, to try to help him win the 2019 presidential election in Argentina. In the lead up to that election, there were many economic problems in Argentina, and Macri had implemented many of the right-wing neoliberal economic policies that Millet is now once again calling to impose, and there was still significant inflation. So the Trump administration told the IMF to give this massive loan to Macri to try to stabilize the currency, to try to prevent inflation going into the 2019 elections as a form of election meddling to try to help this right wing leader win the election. A significant reason that Trump did that is because the US in 2019 also launched its coup attempt against Venezuela's leftist president, Nicolas Maduro, and Trump was relying on Argentina, and, and which was governed by the right-wing leader Macri, and also on other right-wing leaders in the region to join the U.S. in this coup attempt against Venezuela. And Argentina under Macri did recognize the U.S.-appointed puppet Juan Guaido as the so-called interim president of Venezuela, despite the fact that Guaido never participated in a presidential election. Now, normally when the IMF gives a loan to a country, it imposes conditions and forces them to implement neoliberal economic policies, right-wing policies like privatizing state assets, cutting social services, cutting subsidies, reducing wages. And Makati was actually already doing all of those policies. And at the same time, the current account deficit in Argentina was increasing in the years that Makati governed from 2015 to 2019. That means that Argentina was importing more and more than it was exporting, and that weakened Argentina's currency, the peso, against the currency used to buy those imports, which is largely the US dollar. Now, Macri lost those elections, and instead in 2019, the people of Argentina voted for the centrist president, Alberto Fernandez. And he was a very incompetent leader and basically had no economic program. He did tell the IMF that he refused to pay this debt because it was completely illegitimate. It was odious debt taken on for political reasons by the right wing. And essentially, they were trapping the country in unpayable debt. So, yes, Fernandez, Alberto Fernandez was very unpopular in Argentina and was an incompetent president, but he was also left with a basically impossible situation with this unpayable debt. So Fernandez sat down with the IMF repeatedly and tried to negotiate a way out of this debt, and it didn't really go anywhere. Argentina did manage under the Fernandez government to increase its current account from a deficit under Macri to a surplus. That means that, that Argentina was exporting more than it was importing, at least in 2020 and 2021. But in the aftermath of the pandemic, and especially with the proxy war in Ukraine, and with the rise in oil prices and inflation crisis internationally, because of course, Argentina was not the only country with an inflation crisis, although Argentina's inflation was much worse. There, there was this cascade of events along with the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, raising interest rates, which increased the value of the dollar against other currencies, which made it even more difficult for countries like Argentina to pay off their dollar-denominated debt. All of those factors together resulted in a severe crisis in Argentina, and by 2022, the current account was back in a deficit. And Argentina was hemorrhaging money in its foreign exchange reserves, it was very difficult to service its external debt. And what happened is actually China stepped in and started the Chinese Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, started giving yuan loans to the Argentine Central Bank in order to pay off its debt to the IMF. And what that means is that Argentina's foreign exchange reserves became net negative. They simply do not have the dollars needed to service all of their external debt and that continued to fuel this horrific inflation crisis. But it's of course not just the IMF debt. In fact, the majority of Argentina's debt is owed to private bondholders, largely investors, you know, investment funds on Wall Street, vulture funds that are using the wealth of rich people in the global north to invest in the sovereign debt of poor countries in the global south. And I did a separate video, which I will link to in the description below, showing how 
Across the global south, more and more countries are trapped in unpayable debt that was sold on capital, international capital markets to private bondholders. And it shows how rich capitalists in the global north are getting rich at the expense of working people in the global south. But it's very important to stress that in the case of Argentina, the vast majority of that debt is denominated in U.S. dollars. That's what separates Argentina from countries like Japan, for instance, which have significantly more debt as a percentage of GDP. But Japan's debt is largely denominated in its own currency, the yen. Or, for instance, U.S. national debt is denominated in U.S. dollars, which the U.S. can print to pay off. Argentina cannot print dollars to pay off that debt which is why it chronically has these inflation crises as its own currency is depreciating against the currency that it needs, the dollar, in order to pay off that foreign debt. And then the fact that the IMF has given these unpayable loans to Argentina and that the Argentine government said that, it's, that it does not want to pay that debt and wants to restructure it, that made the situation even worse because that uncertainty made it even more difficult for Argentina to sell its debt in international capital markets, because in this neoliberal era, that's what countries in the global south are told to do, is to borrow from foreign investors who are only interested in making a profit. So in order to make up for the decrease in demand, that means that the interest rates on Argentine bonds in these capital markets have skyrocketed, so it becomes even more expensive for Argentina to service its foreign debt, and it becomes even more expensive to, for Argentina to borrow more debt. And then furthermore, Argentina has to print more money because of the higher interest rates in order to service the debt that is owed to international bondholders. And you have a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop where the inflation is made worse by the political uncertainty, thanks to the IMF, thanks to the Trump administration's policies. And it shows how investment policy is inextricably linked to politics. It's not simply a matter of the macroeconomic health of a country. It is inextricably linked to these political decisions that were made. And in the neoliberal era, so many of these countries in the global south are held hostage by international capital markets and foreign investors. And essentially, you cannot actually have a democratic government because your economic policy is not made by the elected government. Your economic policy is made by what is in the best interests of foreign investors, of foreign bondholders. And again, these are largely investment funds on Wall Street and in other Western financial capitals like in London, and they're investing the wealth of rich capitalists who are profiting from the debt of the global south. Argentina is the poster child of this structural crisis in the global capitalist system, which is fundamentally neo-colonial. This is the economics of imperialism. And the people of Argentina, millions of working people and families and elderly people and children, are suffering because of it. And it leads to the rise of these fascistic far-right demagogues like Javier Millet, who instead of dealing with the complexities of this crisis, they claim they have a simple solution, which is to abandon sovereignty and subordinate their country to the U.S. empire. And that really means to subordinate their economy to Wall Street, first and foremost. To understand the problems in the Argentine economy, it's not enough just to look at the current account, which is very basic. All it is is the exports minus the imports. But we also need to look at what kind of exports and imports we're talking about here. And in the case of Argentina, if you look at the data, you can see that the vast majority of Argentina's exports consist of raw materials and agricultural products, including corn, wheat, soybean, soybean oil, also beef and nuts and barley and gold, and only a small percentage of Argentina's exports, representing only around 8% of the total, consist of trucks or cars. But then if you look at the imports into Argentina, you can see it's the exact opposite. Argentina imports computers, broadcasting equipment, telephones, medical equipment, gas, petroleum, oil, cars, motor vehicles, engine parts, pumps, medical instruments. So Argentina is dependent on importing high value added technologies 
in capital goods and it's exporting low value added labor intensive products. This is the exact kind of neo-colonial structure that so many countries in the global south are trapped in. It shows that even though these countries have formal political independence from colonialism after the European powers colonized the world, when it comes to the economic relationships, they're basically the same kind of economic relationships of the colonial era in which the wealthy capitalist countries concentrated in the global north and the west, they siphoned out the wealth, they sucked out the wealth of the global south through extracting raw materials and agricultural products in industries that are labor intensive, but not capital intensive. And the capital intensive industries are concentrated in the global north or the west in what is known as the core of the world's economy, the core of the world system. And therefore the periphery is constantly having its wealth drained. The poor countries in the periphery are having their wealth drained by the rich countries in the core. And in the case of Argentina, this is not new at all. It's a problem that has continued for a hundred years. This is in fact why Argentina was one of the birthplaces of development economics, structuralist economics, with one of the most famous development economists in history, Raúl Prebich, who was from Argentina and worked at the Argentine Central Bank in the 1950s, and then he played an important role in promoting development economics in the United Nations, in alliance with other countries in the Global South, like neighboring Brazil, where there was another very renowned development economist, Celso Furtado, who helped to promote many of these ideas back in the 1950s and 60s. They were emphasizing the importance of countries in Latin America and other parts of the periphery in industrializing their economies and becoming more economically self-sufficient. Argentina and also Brazil had significantly more manufacturing capacity than than they do today. In fact, their economies are now more reliant on agricultural exports and exporting raw materials. And why is that? It's because of the rise of neoliberalism in the late 1970s and really up to today, this hegemonic free market fundamentalist ideology that is represented really the peak of it, the end of neoliberalism by these far right extremist figures like Javier Millet, because that's the logical conclusion of neoliberal fundamentalist ideology, which is fundamentally about financialization and deindustrialization and essentially taking away the sovereignty of countries in the global south by not only making them so reliant on importing capital goods and machine parts and, and high value added capital intensive products from the imperial core, but furthermore, by making these countries entirely reliant on foreign investments. And this is the neoliberal ideology that has been imposed through the Washington consensus in institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. And an army of neoclassical economists who work in those institutions and who teach in universities and are top officials in governments, they constantly tell countries that the way that you should develop is simply exporting. You should always have export led growth and you should have foreign investments. And what that means is that in many cases, these countries do not engage in the kind of protectionist and import substitution industrial policies that they actually need to realistically develop their own national industry and defend their sovereignty. Now, I mentioned earlier the economist Ha Jun Chang, the well-known South Korean development economist, and he has shown in his work, especially in his very important book, Kicking Away the Ladder, he showed that all of the wealthy advanced economies, which tend to be the colonial economies that also got rich through colonialism, but also countries like, for instance, South Korea and Japan, they did not simply get rich by just exporting raw materials. No, they implemented state-led development policies, including significant protectionism. Western countries had, for decades, very high tariffs, including the United States. And in the US, this was known as the American model or the American school of economics that was promoted by people like Alexander Hamilton. They understood that the government had to provide significant support and protectionism and subsidies for infant industries to help build them up 
until they were competitive enough. And then when they were competitive internationally, the government could slowly lift the support for those industries. This is how all of these countries developed and got wealthy. Not only the Western colonial powers, but also Japan and South Korea. Using state-led developmentalist policies like window guidance, for instance, in which the Japanese central bank essentially told the banks which industries to give cheap loans to, to help to develop the technology sector, which is exactly how Japan became rich. And China certainly did not get rich by simply exporting agricultural products. China became the world's largest economy when it's measured at purchasing power parity by massive industrialization, by producing everything. That's how China lifted itself out of poverty, not by listening to the International Monetary Fund and the Washington consensus that told it to simply privatize everything and export raw materials and agricultural products. But China was only able to do that because of state control of the banking sector. The banks are publicly owned by the state, it's socialism, and China used those state banks to provide cheap loans to industry in order to industrialize the country based on their, what their own national interests were, not based on what foreign investors want, not simply to enrich foreign creditors who are not interested in developing China or Argentina or any other country, they simply want to profit from buying sovereign debt like bonds. They're not interested in actually seeing industry develop. Japan and the Western countries, they did not get wealthy by exporting raw materials and agricultural products. And yet their economists, their neoliberal economists and institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, they constantly tell countries like Argentina to continue with this model that has never resulted in success and instead for a hundred years has shown how it has simply trapped countries in this cycle of dependency where anytime, again, with the commodities super cycle, when the price of agricultural products and, and other commodities goes up, you have a boom. And then when the price of these commodities goes down, you have a bust, you have a crash, you have a crisis. The current inflation crisis in Argentina is by no means the first time in the country's history that we've seen these problems. It's a structural problem. In the 1970s, there was another horrible inflation crisis. In 1976, the inflation rate was 438%. And then there was severe inflation of well over 100% for several years throughout the 1970s. This is under a US-backed right-wing military dictatorship, which is not in any way socialist. I mean, they're implementing the same kind of neoliberal policies that we're talking about. And then in the 1980s, in 1984, you had 600% inflation and in 1985 as well. And in 1986, inflation went down to 77%, which to them, it looked like a miracle. That looked like great. I mean, this is the kind of inflation we're talking about today. But then if you actually go forward a few years, you had 3,000% inflation in 1989. 3,000% and then a severe devaluation. So yes, the inflation crisis today is very severe. It's quite bad, over 100%. But when you look at it in the context of Argentine history and you look at a graph of data from the World Bank and the 3,000% inflation in 1989, you can see that this is not simply an isolated problem. And Javier Millet claiming that the solution to everything is dollarization is completely absurd. Over at our website, geopoliticaleconomy.com, we published an article by the Argentine writer Esteban Almiron that looks into this history. It's titled, How Argentina Has Been Trapped in Neocolonial Debt for 200 Years. It is a deep historical dive with so much great information. I will link to that in the description below. One of the things that Esteban Almiron discusses is the previous precedent of some of these schemes that are so similar to Malay's proposed scheme today. In the late 1970s, Argentina's far-right U.S.-backed military dictator Jorge Rafael Videla appointed as his top economic official a neoliberal economist who was trained in the West named José Alfredo Martínez de Oz. Martínez de Oz was from a very wealthy family of conservative landlords in Argentina, and he was the CEO of several companies, and he was friends of billionaires in the U.S. like David Rockefeller. 
he was praised in the Western media as the great right-wing economist who would save Argentina's economy. And he tried to do so by essentially pegging the currency to the dollar by creating an artificial exchange rate that, that very significantly overvalued the Argentine peso. And he, the Argentine government, the military junta, it borrowed huge sums of dollars in order to maintain this artificial exchange rate. And therefore, this led to mass deindustrialization, reversing the import substitution industrialization developmentalist policies that had started under Perón, and that's why Perón today in Argentina is still so popular because of that history of national development in Argentina. Instead, in the 1980s, there was a massive increase in imports because the currency was so overvalued, it became very cheap to import foreign products, but it also became very expensive to export Argentine products. Meanwhile, the military dictatorship privatized all of the state-owned companies that were actually involved in manufacturing production in producing things like automobiles, cars, motorcycles, airplanes. Instead, Argentina imported all of that technology and began to export raw materials and agricultural products. Now, where did this money for the binge of imports come from? Because you need the dollars in order to maintain the peg, to maintain the exchange rate, and also to buy the imports. Well, that those dollars came from debt. And in this period, with the rise of neoliberalism in Argentina, with US-backed right-wing military regimes, you, you saw a massive increase in debt in Argentina. And this is exactly the same kind of cycle that Argentina is trapped in today. And then in the 1990s, you had the rise of the neoliberal president, Carlos Menem, who was the first Peronista president who was also a neoliberal. He claimed to follow in the legacy of Juan Perón, the nationalist, but instead he implemented neoliberal economic policies going against the developmentalist import substitution industrialist policies of Perón and the Peronistas. And with U.S. backing, Carlos Menem pegged the Argentine peso to the dollar at one to one. And what happened? Yes, inflation did temporarily go down, but you had a severe economic crisis and you had unemployment rates skyrocketed to over 18% in the 1990s. And if Javier Millet dollarizes today, you can expect the exact same thing. It's going to be a severe crisis. First, there's going to be extreme devaluation of the currency. And then Javier Millet is going to take a sledgehammer to Argentine workers. He's going to destroy their purchasing power immediately. There's gonna be mass unemployment. There's going to be severe economic crisis. And what's gonna happen? Well, his solution is simply privatizing everything, is privatizing healthcare and education and transportation and providing no government support while you have mass unemployment and crisis. I mean, Javier Millet clearly has not studied any of this history at all. He's solely guided by his extreme far-right fundamentalist free market ideology by so-called anarcho-capitalists, by people like Murray Rothbard, and they think the solution to everything is simply privatization and selling everything off to corporations. That's why Javier Millet has proposed allowing children to be sold on the so-called free market. This is the dire situation that Argentina is in. And as I stressed earlier, it will have repercussions not only in Latin America, but on the entire world. Now, with that said, I'm gonna conclude here. There is more that I could go into, but this has been long enough. I will report more on Argentina in the future. I think it's a very important example to study historically because it shows how these kinds of neo-colonial relationships still continue in the global capitalist system and how countries in the global south are subordinated in a way to the rich, wealthy, imperialist countries in the core that, that echoes the kind of colonial relationship of the 19th century. And instruments like debt are used in order to trap the country so they can never get out of that relationship. And so countries like Argentina cannot embark upon the program of import substitution industrialization that it would need in order to actually develop national industries. Instead, it is trapped in the cycle of dependency and Millet will only continue to make that worse. So with that said, I wanna thank everyone for joining me today. 
please like and subscribe to this video or to the podcast. And I will see you all next time. Thanks a lot.